going on, Caps? This is Mike Care Productions, and I'm at my dad's house once again. And um, thankfully, the Super Bowl has ended, and even though the Eagles uh, lost, but um, the Chiefs won, so it was like they deserved it. So uh, we had to put the pass behind us. So it's time to move on now. So it was a good Super Bowl they did, and it was a close game too. So uh, they were tied in the, uh, like the end, and then um, you know the Chiefs came along. But you know, there's always another year to. Tried to win another Super Bowl, but, you know, uh, at least the 2018 one was all worth it. So, anyway, uh, just now, um, we went to the play music conference with because my dad's supposed to speak there tomorrow. And it's like a little music conference, and we're my, my dad's going to be speaking there eventually tomorrow because we just got back from it today. Because if you guys know Rob Schwartz, his dad's friends, uh, he, he spoke today. You might have made, seen him in other videos. 418 Music, you might all know. So... It's a music label business, and yeah, I hope uh, it all goes well for him, and yeah, it's going to be great. Before we start this vlog, um, I want to show you guys something real quick. Look, if I could dump this all out right here, I want to go through all these. So, this is like a newspaper from, I don't know what that is, but we got a cup right here, Who uh, Mag, which is uh, Robert Schwartz's company right here, and what else? We got uh, something right here, a CD. And it says coming March 2023, uh, up, uplift full or something like that. And let's see, we got we got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I don't know. The, yeah, of course, Rob Schwartz, and there he is again. And uh, let's see more. We got another, another CD. It says something about Who Mag right here. And I think this is like to be a, a kit right here, a wallet. I don't know, but uh, we got a. Big party right here. I don't know what kind of CD that is. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got. A lot, a lot more right here. We got a bottle of water, which I don't care about, which I can have later. And if I can go all this quickly, and right here we got a, a Bang World Champion hoodie right here. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is all the stuff I got right here. Uh, if you guys want to check all these out, I mean, uh, by the time you're watching this, it might be already over. But, you know, uh, this is what I got. I'll see you guys uh, in a little bit. So, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, can I just say one more thing in regards to that? Um, you know, I always tell new artists, too, you don't need a talent agent at this juncture, right? You should be your own talent agent. So in, in, in your own market, you should know all the rooms that are afforded to you to play in, right? And then you need to know who the buyers are for those rooms on your own before you even reach guys like us, right? And you can get your own idea expressed and get yourself into that room to perform before you even, you know, listen, we're up here because we, we make money on commission. There's, there's no commission from the onset right away. Um, so you need to really carve out the rooms in your city and state that you want to perform in and, and understand and build a relationship with those, those club owners and, and talent buyers for those rooms. To take that a step further, the key here is to be professional and be businesslike. You need to have a great presentation. When I'm looking at an artist, I, I, I don't care about the recording as much as I'd like to see a live performance. Um, so you need to have presentation materials that are simple to the point. If you mention 15 seconds, I might not even give it five, okay? Um, I used to hate it when people, and I'm dating myself too, but they give you all this music, they said, oh, you should have listened to track seven. No, track seven should have been first. Okay. Advertised within the music industry, your artists can earn upwards of 10 to 100 times more than they would on Apple Music or Spotify. Um, and so, we're leveraging some very interesting technologies. I've been a lifelong musician. I've been in the music industry for a long time, as well as technologists. And uh, we're really looking at how to leverage new Web3 technologies um, in order to help creators monetize in ways like never before. Awesome, awesome. Next up, we have my man, Corey Lewin, CL. All right, Did you ask? Awesome, yeah. spin worlds. All right, shout out to Rob. Shout out to everybody who came out. Um, yeah, own an agency called DigiWax Media and uh, another one called Spin World and basically, uh, you know, came up through uh, creating a digital record pool and, and marketing music uh, globally to DJs uh, and really got immersed in the Web3 space as well and uh, became a sort of a conductor or a connector between 
uh, music and Web3. Uh, helped consult a lot of projects. Uh, Biggie Spoils Drop was one of. Uh, worked with a company called Vuzak that does social tokens. Uh, help out with a, a cluster of others, but really just trying to help artists to monetize their, their careers in a better way, um, a decentralized way uh, with community. And, um, you know, be free versus uh, the way it's been. Um, shout out to everybody who came out. <clears throat> and then last but not least, my man at the end right there, Kwasi Asari. He is media technology visionary, CEO of Fidia, and he's also on the Fast Company exec board. How you guys doing? Uh, yeah. Uh, shout out to Rob for putting this all together. Um, my background is, uh, I guess, long story short, family is from Ghana, so work a lot internationally. Always think about how things we do here affect people in the developing world. As far as my music industry credentials, done about 25 million records uh, over the years, working as the first social media hire at Sony Music. So I literally built MySpace pages for John Legend and Beyonce and all the Sony Music artists. And yeah, MySpace was a very important thing about 20 years ago. Um, uh, I, after that, I worked at Cornerstone where I actually met CL. I ran digital marketing there, uh, where I worked on Princess 3121, LL Cool J's Mr. Smith, Ice Cube Lab Not Fry Later, and a number of commercial projects. I then uh, I worked on Diddy's Press Play as well while I was at Cornerstone, and I was then asked to become the first digital media director at Bad Boy Entertainment. So I worked for years building Puppy's entire digital uh, <coughs> empire, if you will, across all of his brands, across Sean John Fragrance, Ciroc, um, Bad Boy Records, 2008, I ran Puffy's campaign with Barack Obama. Uh, I was able to, you know, help Barack Obama get elected by leveraging the social media presence of Puffy, Jay-Z, Mary J. Blige, etc., who all supported Barack Obama that year. Um, 2010, I left Bad Boy and I started investing in building platforms, many of them in the Web3 space. Uh, in addition to being the founder of a media agency, I'm also an early investor in the Billionaire Zombies Club, which is a Polygon-based uh, NFT community. I'm also the co-founder and CMO of SIO, which is a company building Web3 tools for sovereign nations uh, that basically will allow us to preserve cultural heritage, hopefully forever, across the globe. Uh, and as Rob said, I do contribute to Fast Company as a journalist and a member of their executive board. I'm just gonna be a little more intimate and pop over here with you guys. So let's do that. All right. So let's start with the first question. Um, and I'm gonna speak a little closer to the microphones. Um, basic question: Web three. What is it, and what's the evolution from Web two? We're we gonna start with uh, Noble. You know, it's uh, the first time I ever did any kind of programming. I was in uh, fourth grade, and it was on an Apple II device. <coughs> And we were trying, we were very excited to be able to get a little triangle to move around on the screen. Um, it's called Turtle. I've watched the evolution of what's going on very aggressively from um, 2400 or 1200 baud modems to uh, 5G and beyond. They're talking about 6G and 7G and, uh, you know, fiber optic cable. The reality is that. Um, we use these delineations such as Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and Web 3.0 in order to uh, encapsulate something that's so large and to give it some kind of mental structural control of what's happening. But realistically, we've gone far beyond um, what Web 3 was even conceived of initially. When you have things like Chat GPT and you have AI creating art and we're really hitting the singularity in which the real world and the digital world are becoming one. And most of us, about 90% of us plus, are living our lives primarily digitally. I even see people on the phones right now. They're not even present and they're not even with the people they're with. They're actually all over the internet and all over uh, the world. So Web3 has become uh, just a moniker for us synergizing both the uh, online presence that we have 
with our in real life presence that we're trying to kind of merge and then making it seamless that you can see things in AR. And you know, Google Glass was the first thing that scared people almost a decade ago in people having heads up displays and combining both the digital and the real world. And now Web3 is uh, got a point where people feel comfortable with having those conversations of no privacy and no uh, autonomy from their digital lives and those becoming synced. So when I hear Web3, I'm looking at it as an opportunity for the digital life and the real life to function as one. And that's really where, where we're supposed to head. Uh, this fractured life is very difficult. Cool, does anybody else want to talk about Web3? Yeah, I'd say that one of the main drivers of Web3 is, is the transition from the seamless exchange of information to the seamless exchange of value. And then there's other ways that we can view these digital experiences from a small rectangle in our hands to a 360 degree sort of virtual reality type of interface. And so where Web 1 was essentially static web pages, Web 2 was interactive web pages, Web 3 is not just interactive, but has crypto infused and also VR, AR type of capabilities. And so that those are the main drivers, I would say. Any buzz from the time in? Web3? Well, I'll just add that, you know, one of the beauties of uh, Web3 is that <clears throat> you get to um, um, keep some more of your privacy uh, and get to, you know, sort of hold your da data if you're on the right platforms. Um, you know, a lot of the tools that we use, whether it's YouTube or the streaming platform you're talking about, um, you know, <laughs> they've been pretty much just making a digital footprint of us from jump. Um, and selling that data, utilizing that data to make themselves rich. Well, one of the things Web3 allows you to do is to keep that data uh, and you can now monetize it, amongst a lot of other things. I mean, we're, it's it's such a dynamic platform. Uh, I'm sure that everybody can go down almost in every industry and, and sort of show you how to uh, to keep your data. But, um, you know, examples like YouTube, um, you know, there's data, you know, that, that where you can put the video up, but YouTube may flag it. They may say, well, great, we'll run ads against it. We'll do this, that, the third. You'll get nothing. Um, data will pay you in tokens, uh, and you get to keep that data and do a lot more with it. So just one example. Okay. How about you, Quasi, anything you want to say? Um, yeah, when I think of Web3, uh, you know, I, I think about the relationship between uh, consumers and their data. In Web 2, it was all about third-party platforms like Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, to have you know, the relationship between uh, people and their information. Web 3 allows, hopefully will allow us to own more of our data directly, um, as well as leverage you know, emerging tools in the XR universe, uh, AR, VR, et cetera. So play out so you could have a virtual festival, you could have a virtual concert, virtual club, virtual sort of DJ room, or any sort of experience where people from all around the world come together. The location doesn't matter, but it's really more about interest, what you're interested in, the type of music you're interested in. And I mean, obviously, metaverses can be well beyond music. It could be for social outlets, for gaming, for broadcasting, for sports, anything. Um, but as far as the music is concerned, I think the really interesting opportunities in the metaverse have to do with virtual concerts, NFT ticketing, as well as just connecting with people who are into the same type of music that you're in. So there's a social aspect as well as an experiential aspect. And one of the products we're working on building is something called Jam Fest, which is essentially a virtual festival in the metaverse with NFT ticketing. It's sort of, sort of like a festival that never ends. You have different venues and different shows and different um, places where you can live, uh, live stream music or go to different uh, types of performances and basically use NFTs to get into these various performances or earn things. Um, so that's sort of how I see metaverse affecting music. How about you, Kwasi? Yeah, you know, um, the metaverse isn't new. It, do you guys remember a movie called Lawnmower Man? Anybody remember that movie? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, I remember. It's a movie from the <laughs> 90s. It's a long time ago. But in that movie, uh, a, a mentally impaired person is able to become uh, 
learn skills by leveraging VR, and in that case, psychotropics. But in that movie, they explore virtual reality. This is 30 years ago. There's been evolutions of metaverse and kind of iterations of it for, for a long time. Even some of the applications that we consider Web 2.0 have elements of the metaverse, things like Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces. You're bleeding into the metaverse with those applications. Um, and so I, it's not, I don't think the metaverse is something that should be daunting or people should be afraid of. We're all kind of leaning in, bleeding into the metaverse with a lot of the things that we're doing day to day today. Now, as we become more immersed in these uh, virtual experiences, more of our lives will bleed into this kind of virtual space. But I think that gives us the opportunity to do all kinds of things. As was said earlier, the metaverse allows us to you know, live beyond you know, what the capabilities of our physical bodies. And that has um, all kinds of applications, not just for music, film, and TV, but also for things like healthcare, um, for the future of work, etc. And so uh, I'm super excited to see all these new technologies that are coming out and thinking about how not only musicians can monetize them, but also how can metaverse be used in other parts of society. Cool, cool. So um, I guess let's just jump into this word we keep hearing, these three letters of NFTs. So you guys, um, why don't you start, uh, Andrew? What break down the basic of a, what is an NFT? An NFT is essentially a digital token that is unique. Um, so where you have fungible currency, which is say uh, US dollars or fungible fiat currency, you could have fungible tokens like a Bitcoin, for example. Fungible is just another word for, you have identical copies of it. Um, and each single copy is interchangeable for the other and there's no distinctive characteristics. So you don't know one dollar is the same as another dollar, one Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin. There's no like addition number, there's nothing um, unique about it. Whereas non-fungible tokens, uh, it's the exact opposite of fungible. So every single token is unique and that might be a serial number, but that could also be the piece of artwork that's attached to it. You could attach multiple files to a fungible token. You could attach a deed to a property. You could attach uh, really anything, whether it's identity related or media related, um, value related, it could be a security, it could be anything. Um, so it's really just carving out a piece of in digital space uh, and in which you have consensus, global distributed consensus basically a network in which multiple nodes around the world all agree that this is a digital piece of real estate um, in which basically a box that you could fill with anything, media or any type of value. And uh, it can isolate the most commonly recurring patterns in, in hit songs, for example. If you look at a, at a, at a uh, style of music that was popular in the 90s, it would be able to kind of pick out even songs in new genres that would conform to these properties of, of hits. Um, so, you know, we use AI in, in, in pattern recognition within, within music, and that is a completely different application than, than, than what we're seeing uh, talking about today with language models. But it is AI, and uh, AI will continue to impact uh, this space a lot. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, if anyone else wants to jump in on AI before I ask Michael's last question, uh, this, this is kind of open and touches on everyone, so feel free to chime in, guys. Well, I mean, I would say, like, we, so we spoke about it yesterday that, um, you know, chat and you know, there's all these other people uh, creating these bots. Um, they are impacting the space in every space. Everything that we're doing in terms of uh, information, um, you know, data points, um, the thing is that you guys have to start to use them or to program um, your mind and start using these tools to <clears throat> give yourself more opportunity. Um, there's a lot of, obviously, uh, conversations happening. Uh, I would just say start to educate yourself, um, see how you can utilize it. Like for producers, you can program bots to make beats for you at this point with your sounds. Um, obviously, you know, it's a lazier way, but it's, it's inevitable that it's gonna be going that way. Um, you know, people are creating, uh, uh, you know, music and creating YouTube channels and turning out sort of sounds and, and, and having that channel run that people take and study to. Um, it's another way to monetize your talent, um, but study it and, and learn how to use these things because they're here and they're only gonna get bigger. Gio, Chris, anything on AI for now? Yeah, actually, 
one thing that, that I actually used the other day, which was, I don't know if you guys as artists have this problem, but I have a trouble describing myself as an artist. Like, and I, it's just maddening, I hate it. Like, somebody has to be, can I just get your bio? I'm all, ah, you just told me to do something I hate, thanks. So, I used chat GPT for it the other day, and that, it did a better job than I did. <laughs> so there's one thing, one mark. Yeah, yeah, I, it did a much better job, because it thought of things that I, like I'm, and like a lot of artists, I'm a little embarrassed about, uh, like, really nailing down what my sound is supposed to be, but it doesn't have embarrassment. So it just, like, it thought of some good phrases I would never have for long. All right, fine. Interesting. So that's uh, maybe marketing too. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up with use, using uh, those kinds of tools to create a good marketing blur, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's getting easier. Yeah, much easier. So Chris, with with the growth of new musicians adding audio to streaming services going through the roof, um, how can new musicians, new artists, go about growing their audience right now? Ooh, this is the big hard one, right? So. Let me get a sense, actually, for people. I don't know, I kind of want to show hands, but the problem is, is that people aren't going to want to raise their hands. I'll raise my hand first. How many of you out there who are artists or producers have paid more than $2,000 to be on a Spotify playlist? Hmm. Yeah, all right. You don't want to raise all your hands. I know some people don't, you know. But here's the thing. Trying to grow an audience when you're a new artist or trying to get yourself established um, means that you have to be put in front of consumers in a way that, like, they, it's hard for them, harder for them to ignore. But this is an increasingly difficult problem. Made more difficult by the fact that there's more new artists every month. Yeah, the tools, um, we were just discussing this backstage, they're like, the tools for creating music are getting easier, thank goodness, it's about time, but that means way more people doing it, way more people trying. And so there can't be that many slots on the most popular Playlists on Spotify and Apple Music. It's not possible. You know, I, I read something, not to cut you off, I read Go something yesterday. There's over 350 release, releases a week on iTunes. I mean, I remember being the Billboard reporter back in the day. There was maybe 10 releases a week. There was like 350, and just, um, you know, we're in dance and pop, there's just 350 a week. And that, I mean, it, it's crazy. Yeah, imagine that, uh, let's say you're the person that um, sits on playlist uh, distribution and is trying to do playlist promotion. This is much worse than radio promotion ever was because that price is only gonna go up, right? Like, it, it's going to exceed the ability for the playlist to capture attention. The music audience didn't get much larger. Like Spotify and Apple Music have a pretty serious saturation through the world. So, and YouTube, excuse me. So given that the audience is sort of fixed, that's a price that will only grow as more new artists get at it. So here's the problem, the biggest problem, how do you grow an audience? I think the way that you have to grow an audience is to be much more focused locally. One of the things that seems to have never left music is that it is so often regionally and locally experienced. This is a prime example, right? Play Music Conference itself, um, the city of Philadelphia, like you still have um, these very strong ties to communities and music. And so I think the best way to grow a new audience is to grow local. I, um, just adding on to that, I feel like um, as artists, you guys sort of need non-biased people to analyze and tell you your strengths and your weaknesses. And take the time to highlight those strengths, even if it's outside of music. So if you're a singer or, or whatever, an MC, um, maybe you're a really good cook. Maybe you're a hell of a barbecue person. Maybe you're a hell of a, um, a storyteller. But you know, content marketing is, is important. You know, um, doing you know wh whether that's hey, I'm gonna show you how to make a uh, a, a ribeye today um, with my music in the background or whatever. But finding ways to connect your content, your music to maybe another side of you, um, the work that has to be put into it really is the difference. Because we all have these tools, but who's gonna actually do? you know, a YouTube video every week, who's gonna actually do reels every day or every other day, who's gonna do TikTok features every single, you know, every other day and actually do it. That's the difference between getting more followers, getting more attention, uh, and not, that's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the things. So, you know, social media marketing, content marketing.
and, and just to piggyback off of him and and David with, with Spotify, I really think that number one, you have to be honest with the artist. If the song's not good, don't take the project on. Yeah. That's number one. Don't take anybody's money. Okay? If the song is good, you try to help them and and you know groom them on how Spotify and the algorithm works. Mr. Mick is my partner and um and head artist promotion. And we have a lot. We're in dance. Everybody wants Spotify, everybody wants iTunes, everybody wants Billboard. Most artists that we come up with, they don't even know how to pitch the song a few weeks before it comes out. You know, well, did you pitch the song to the curators? Well, what's that? You know, so they come in and you need to really tell them, manage your expectations. Because especially if you're a brand new artist, listen to people like myself and these amazing gentlemen on the panel um, and understand what you're doing and what you're paying for. I think that's key with promotion. Um, so I, I just wanted to take you back before what you said. The right strategy so you can go in the right place. Um, and the other thing I want to say is advertising is key. If you're successful and you start to gain, gain attention in a certain way, um, help yourself by spending a little bit of money on advertising. Um, I know social media advertising is not as expensive. Uh, it can be, but it's really not. Uh, initially, you know, we talk about ten dollars, five dollars. Uh, you know, can go a long way. Um, but as you go, you know, if you, you you can use things like brand Zuka and other things to make thirty second commercials and put them out there on you know Pluto TV and all that stuff. So you know, just get with a creative team that can help you from a, a strategic marketing side. Um, Chris, uh, since. Uh, COVID, remote collaborations become even more important, more yeah. prevalent. Um, what are the best ways for musicians to collaborate online without having to meet in person? And, and maybe you can factor in, you know, what you and what Mix does to help facilitate that. Yeah, this is, a, this is hard because I think that a lot of uh, musicians, um, uh, they, they kind of uh, had to uh, double down on um, a strategy they didn't they didn't really foresee, which was, uh, I need to I need to do um, some basic um, team building, and I can't go anywhere, and I can't perform. <laughs> um, so um, there's a, a bunch of great tools out there. Um, there's still a couple of spots that aren't really done yet, particularly like if you want to um, record together uh, uh, online without being in a studio. This is uh, still not great. There's a couple of solutions. I, I really like BandLab for. Um, some working out some ideas online. That recording software is pretty good. Um, uh, I, I don't know how comfortable I'd feel about a finished product, but uh, I think that at least getting that early stuff happening between two artists there is great. Um, for all the other tools online, I know that artists are using, um, this is a, the little self-serving part, but I know a lot of artists have to use Dropbox and uh, uh, Box and Google Drive to like share things, um, but uh, do people love Dropbox out there? I don't know. Oh, that's it. That's a lot of notes. What? Do big people love Dropbox. All right. Um, well, that's sad for my friends who work there. <laughs> friends who work there. But they also knew that this was a problem. Um, so one of the reasons um, Mixed exists as a software at all is I wanted to try and replace Dropbox for um, musicians um, because it needs to be a combination streaming service. Uh, that's the thing that Dropbox won't do. Um, so that when you like share a link or whatever, like it'll play, and you can have playlists, and you can you know, I, I that's the part I wanted to solve. So that's what Mix does. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that a lot of the organizational tools for, for musicians um, are still lacking. Like there's going to be more stuff. Oh, you know what I really like right now is um, if you if you've got like work with a producer or something, and you need to break that out into like the music versus the vocals part. Um, I totally spent a bunch of money on audio shape. I think TikTok and Instagram is is the two, you know, top ways to get your music out there right now, except for distribution. Now, I'm older. I'm 55. I'm not into Facebook. I think Facebook is for the older crowd. No disrespect to anybody, but I think if you're you have music out, I think your target needs to be Instagram and TikTok. Videos, 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 videos. Putting a picture up on TikTok does nothing for you. Putting a video up, I mean, putting a picture up on Instagram does nothing for you. Putting a video up on Instagram, it does amazing things for you. And, and it leads, you know, and, and I, 
I just looked today, we signed an artist from Reverb Nation. We have a song coming out, and Danine is one of our artists, said, what, how are her TikTok friends? Had no idea. She has 285,000 followers on TikTok. So that gets the ball rolling. We just booked a show for, for her also. Somebody saw her on TikTok. They just booked her July 29th in Providence because they didn't realize that she had a new single out. I, I, I just think the way to go now is, is Instagram and, and TikTok. I, I just think it's, there'll be something new in a year. You know, I think if you have a great record, those are the outlets you hit for. Guys go out there and they make the record. It's old school, but it's what I do. So. Y'all know the history. Y'all know Puffy. Y'all know, Puffy. Y'all know Diddy. Come on. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Dre uses a lot of guys on his record. There you go. There you go. And when he got honored recently, he acknowledged that. Yeah. Yep. You know. And a lot of times you'll play to a loop. You'll be, you'll get a beat, and then you'll do live instruments way over top of it, and cut more things on top of it. Like you know, did that all the time with the roots. We we get a, a, a beat, a loop, a sample, and then play over top of it, and then create your own whole vibe. But that certainly wasn't. The, the, it, the producer wasn't the, producer, the person who came in and set with the, the loop, loop, loop. Because be, right. it was like 105 hours after that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, on that note, like of, of finding, a, of placing the song that you've done, I mean, David, your work with the Roots, they were, at, when you first started working with them, they weren't on a label. No, so not at you. all. In fact, that's how I got, I actually gave them a spec deal. So meaning that, meaning, you know. Meaning uh, spec, you aren't gonna get paid for that. Yeah, right? spec, I doubt if I'll ever get paid for it. Right. But, <laughs> but this one finally worked, what do you know? <laughs> a spec deal that actually worked. I, mm -hmm. I had uh, three in my life that worked and that's pretty amazing actually. So, but uh, Bruce was one of them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, actually it is. Um, so, um, so they were just, you know, 18, 19 years old, just starting out, South Street. And, their attorney was my attorney, and we started making it happen. And, and those, you know, from that is how you develop that sound. And with the and we had that small little room at Sigma, and we had our own sound coming, and we worked on that whole idea. Yeah, um, that's what that's how you develop your the whole beginning of certain things, especially when you, they're young. A lot of you people will be working with new artists, right? New artists that are coming in, and you know. The, the, you don't know what they're going to be later, but you're starting to like create the whole idea. Very important role in that situation. At the end of the day, I'm getting emotional because I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I was like, yo. It's, but it's the same plight. Yeah, same plight. It's the, the same, same plight, for all, plight yeah. for all of us. Absolutely. We, we, no matter we what did the same of... journey. Mm -hmm. Wow. Exactly. Vic, have you ever, uh, what's your experience with speculative deals? I'm sorry? What, your, what's your experience with speculative deals? That wasn't the back then. Oh, yes. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> lend it out, lend it out. Well, you know, look, I've had some that worked and some didn't work. But I mean, like I've had this one guy who, whose name I'm not going to mention, you know, I did two spec records with him and, you know, put him on the map, got him going, got him out doing this and that, and next thing I know, he's going to Muscle Shoals and paying him $20,000 to make a record. <laughs> You know, and my deal with him was 50-50, you know? Um. And I never saw my 50. And in his mind, well, I spent more money than you, so I should, don't, shouldn't have to pay you. And I'm like, well, I don't really know if that works for me. But, so I mean, you just had to cut the cord. I don't really do them anymore. You know, they're, they're just a problem. No, and then also when you do that, like you end up then the next, if you do the right thing with an artist, like, like just like the Roots, once you did that first record, boom. The next record, guess where they went? To me. The next record, they went to me. The next record, they went to me. You it works I mean? that way, yes. That's how it works because you build that relationship. Now sometimes, and this is be very clear with this, the first order of business for a label is to separate you from the artist because they want to have more of the control over it, and you might represent Amen. control over the other yeah. right. <laughs> right, I mean, I'm sure you've never, any of us experienced that. Yeah. You're, no, you're so that's a danger to them, they hate you. Because yep. you, know, you can talk to the artist in a way that they never do. Right, so and that's something, you, and then that's why you, know, you try to keep your paperwork together so that if that happens, Absolutely. and that's what happens, and it's okay, because that's business, and that's what you're in, the music business. It may suck, but that's the business, and then you continue. I mean, at the end of the day, too, there's situations whereas you might give an artist their hit record, right. mm -hmm. but they never come back to you. 
after they got their hit right. record. That happens too. So yeah. now it's like, all right, so I thought we was cool, <laughs> but nah, we're cool, but I'm cooler over here doing what I want to do after you help me blow up. You know what I mean? So yeah, this whole thing is a gamble. You know what I mean? You just gotta be strategic. You gotta be paying attention. You gotta get your paperwork done. You yes. gotta, you know, make sure that you uh, protect yourself. And the main thing is when things go like that, don't get bitter. Just realize that's Not the business. Because if you get bitter, that's when it's over. Not at all. So oh, yeah. you really yeah. just you gotta just say, do, just keep it yeah, yeah, it sucks, whatever, but it's whatever. You just keep going and just, you know, it, it is what it is because down the road, something it else will come right back. Yeah, it, or, it, it yeah when it goes back. It happens, though. So I've seen it. It happens. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've been, left, I've been left out of deals that I've developed for six months because wow. they were very religious. And, you know, don't worry, you're part of the family. <laughs> they, go on, they go on and get their few million, wow. then, they, then their deal falls apart two years later and you get the phone call. Like, so, um, Look, what are you, you doing? doing? A lot of things, and like, we really just love to get together again. We had so much. Hey, good luck to you. As wow. soon as you hear the line. You. That's crazy. And then you move on. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say for every, uh, every spec deal that worked out, there was two or three that didn't work out. I look at the one that worked out or two that worked out and say, you know what? Those were worth it. That's okay. The other ones, I should have done my, my business better. But I was young. I was young. I didn't. I believed people that, you know, you have, a, you have a good heart. You think everybody else has the same intentions. Like, we're doing this as a team. And, like, you're not, they said they're not going to forget me when they, when they pop off. And they pop off. And you're like, what about Look, the words Everybody family go. and team, when you hear those words, <laughs> yeah, that's you're dangerous. Just, yeah, that's you dangerous. You can't rely on that. You can't rely on that in this business or any business. Or any business, honestly. Get your business straight and then you can't be mad at anybody. Yep, speaking of that, I would just say, particularly with urban music artists who come in independently and they may not have the budgets to pay what people like us are worth, you just pick and choose your battles. Say, all right, I won't take an advance for producing a track for you. But we're going to structure the business on the back end. You know what I mean? Meaning out, make sure I get my percentage as a composer. Make sure that I get a percentage off of the distribution rights, any sync licensing rights if the song gets picked up in film and television or whatever the case may be. So that if the record is successful in some capacity, I didn't take any upfront money. At least I have the business straight on the back end. And if they want to move on and not come back to me, so be it. At least I took care of that part. Well, why don't you talk a little bit to that? The, because, you know, I don't know if everybody here understands like all the parts of the deal to even look out for. Absolutely. Of working with an artist when they come to you and it's maybe not even speculative, but say say for the case of this, there is a speculative portion, which is they're not gonna pay you upfront. Right. What are the other deal points that you're looking at? Uh, specifically independent, because major's a little different. Uh, I can get into that too, but for independence in my particular case, I work out a percentage as a composer, you know what I mean? Uh, if I bring in a writer, they, they get their percentage and their credit. If the artist writes for themselves, then they get their percentage, you know, usually 50-50. And then on the back end, on the distribution, I work out a percentage, you know, if they're using their own label or they have a label and someone else is funding the marketing, then I would deal with that independent label and work the business out on that, or, or that's, um, um, case. And then as far as uh, like sync rights, what I mentioned a little earlier, that's the rights you have to, as a composer to a song that gets picked up and used in a, a, a TV show or in a film or, you know, like a, as a, a sync license. So you work on a percentage of the rights in a sync license. Sometimes people get advanced money for syncs. So let's just say if you get a sync and you didn't get paid to produce the track up front. Does everybody understand what, what, what we mean by syncs? I, I hope I'm not talking too fast. Synchronization. Yeah, synchronization, yeah. Meaning Licensing. like it goes on behind a commercial or a yeah, Oracle. Yeah. Uh, in a television show, there's always music, and, and, and CBS will pay you, or pay the artist, has to pay the artist for the rights to, to play their music in the show. Right. Exactly. I think if we if we just let everybody know right now, we're this is a whole table full of geeks. We're not. We're we're really geeks. I'm sorry. Right? I have to so it all the time. We we're, we're getting to the point. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. business. Yeah. Yep. So that's what we focused on. So yeah, just basically wrapping up what syncs are, um, you know, work out a percentage of the sync rights. If there's an advance payment for licensing that song in that film or TV show, you know, get a percentage of that advance. And put all of that in writing up front. You know what I mean? So and the same. a lot of talent, that's all. I mean, to me, a beat is not a song. You know, somebody has got to take that and make it into something that right. 
people can sing in the shower because you know they're not going to be going boop, 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 in the shower. It's full production. Full production. I'm well aware of that, but they're not songs. I mean, Quincy Jones said that you know 25 years ago. I remember reading when Quincy said, "Look, wow, I can call four guys, have them over here in an hour, and we'll have a spoken track." But you know what? It's not a song, and it's not. A and, and you're right. And I, but I think my point was, don't worry about the saturation. Worry about what you do and push yourself to be better. Well, you can't control that. So you, you can't control the saturation. I, I, and and I, we couldn't yeah. control the MP3 destroying the CD. The, you know, CD had some protection. That, cassette, well, that, I missed all the cassette was, more than anything. No, all of that was because evolution. If you wanted to rip off my music on a cassette, it would take a couple evolution. hours to make one copy. So that was actually like, I would vote. Maybe in a second for them to come back with some kind of... All cassette. of that is evolution. It's evolution. But at the same time, you, you know where you come from. And what are we doing this music for? That's the point too that allows us to create to the best of our Purpose. ability. You have to I want to Purpose. invoke you have to emotion. I want to invoke feeling. I want to invoke a happy time. I want to uh, help help you reminisce on a sad time, but make you feel good about it. So, what's the direction you're going with with your production? With your creation, this is this is life. This is we're here to do this because it's supposed to help us move forward. You know what I mean? Yep. That's what music is all Art about. Is I don't care about what the context, what the you know what I mean. No, I do care. Part of me because some of the context right now is dumbed down in us. Where I'd rather just lift us up, right? You know what I'm saying? Yep. So that's what I do music for. That's how I produce. That's what I mean to send out to the people. You know what I'm saying? So when you have those agendas, you know, the shit's gonna come out good. Mm -hmm. That's what you were about, right? Yep. That's what we're here to do. So as a as like a young producer starting out, or somebody who's um, <clears throat> maybe an artist as well, uh, who wants to find the money, who wants to find their toehold in a, in a, a, a toehold to their career, to their career, you know, to like what they're gonna do. Um, what do you think their best play? What do you think their best track is? Start off by not doing it for the money. Oh Let's yeah. Start there. Yeah. Good point. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Don't ever do this music business for the money. You do it because you love it, and if you love it, that'll make you work really hard, and you'll never work a day in your life. Absolutely. That's true. Right. I agree. So having said that. <laughs> <laughs> So don't do it. Don't, don't chase the money. Um, it's there's there, that. I mean, what David just said is everything. Obviously, we we we're, we're we got into music. I mean, we're weird. You know, we like we're very internal. We listen. You know, we listen and try to a lot. A lot of times on things like this, it's kind of funny. It's a, there's a, an expression of like talking about music is like dancing about architecture. And it's, Elvis Costello said it, no? no, no okay, so anyway. We'll, go yeah. back, we'll review that later. Yeah, yeah, it's that'll fun. be on the test. But no, y'all yeah, know we all valedictorians from high school, right? I know that, right? No, seriously. All of us. That's uh, not true. But the, <laughs> but the, uh, the you know, the, um, it's very, music is very internal, we listen. Sometimes we're not talking, we're listening, and, 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 uh, and, and kind of deciding what, what sounds are going together in our head, trying to figure out what those things are, and, and, uh, and to take that and distill it into a song or into a sound is really, it's a talent that we share, you know, this is something that we share. And we're chasing, and, in a, and then to able to be able to turn that into career, obviously, we'd be so lucky. We should be so lucky. True. And uh, those of us at the tables that have been so lucky, but you know, there's been a lot of times Things have changed. Things are the the, the production uh, uh, landscape of today is very different than it was back in the days of the two inch machine and, a, and hiring a drummer. Uh, we was doing the eight track, with the you know the task cam. My tax. first boss tax and, task Yeah. <laughs> my first recording deck was a. We did boss tapes. We yeah. did boss tapes the the night before with the um, awesome two radio show, and we had to go to school the next day. Everybody did they dub tapes. Pause tapes, whatever, whatever, and took those tapes to school, and you know, but that's where we, that's the psyche, that's where we caught it from. It was like, 
that's how we was moving, but this ain't that no more. No, I mean, there's this a lot is of competition at for the touch of a dollar. We can get anything. Like you can, this, certainly you have better tools to be honest, like mm -hmm. in some ways, oh, yeah, but it's, you gotta watch, the, it's the creativity thing mm -hmm. is the issue. That's what makes us dope though, though, because we are blessed to have been part of the beginning oh, yeah, and the yeah. new, so we can mix that all around. Well, now the ones that came up, the these producers now, they don't know what. Some of them don't even know what vinyl is. Mm -hmm. yeah. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? No, I'm dead serious. Yeah. Vinyl. <laughs> what? That, that record just came out. Well, nah, well, that well, record is a sample from <laughs> back then. You don't know that? No, I don't know that. I never even. I didn't even think about it. You know what I'm saying? So right. all I'm trying to say is that we were blessed in a time to have saw it happening, moving, growing with it, and we're good while it's still evolving. So, you know, we gotta make use of all the tools that's going on now, but the difference is we know what we know from Yeah, the education back when it helps. Yeah. Well a lot. you know I was taught at the very beginning that the real purpose of the producer, and I mean the real purpose, is to develop an identifiable sound for each individual artist. Yeah, there you go. And that's kind of just disappeared because everybody now has the same stuff. They're in the same bedrooms with the same monitor. Yeah, they're just making the same things. And they don't really understand how to translate that into what the artist needs to make the artist a viable entity. You can have all the tracks you want. It's not going to help if you can't do that. And uh, I... I mean, that's the single biggest thing, and I think, you know, I mean, hey, there's all sorts of great tracks out there, they're fun to listen to and everything, but until somebody does that, it's not really a viable thing that you can do anything with. It's, uh, you bring out their spirit. Yeah. That's sure. what the tracks are for. What do you to gotta bring say? out the spirit of that particular artist and person. I mean, Biggie had something to say, two people <laughs> had something to say, and that kind of went away in the era of, Every hip hop record is going to be tits and ass for a while, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't know. I know about tits and ass. You don't have to tell me about it. I've or seen how it great the rapper is. is. <laughs> how about something more? Rate. How about well, how something many that affects people? Anyway, um, that concludes it for this video. And I hope you guys enjoyed the play conference or whatever it was called. I have to make sure I put it on the um, title of the video. But um, it was a good time. So my dad spoke. Uh, one of my dad's friends, Mig, who you might know because he, he might have been in one of the videos before, and I, I believe Rob Schwartz has definitely been one of the videos before in my videos, and he, they're all nice dudes, so uh, credit for them. So anyway, the video might be very long, so I'm just gonna end it right away. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and make sure you give it a like, subscribe, and you to Mike Care Productions. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and TikTok, and I am Mikey Cap at Snapchat. And all right, Mikey Care Productions, signing out, telling thanks for watching. Peace.